So welcome uh, to a conversation about purpose. Uh, I'm Lynn and this is Matt, um, and we're excited that you've joined us uh, for this conversation. I want to open um, with a bit of a story about EY's purpose uh, and the road that we've been on to bring that to life. Many people in the room may know that 15 years ago in this country, we launched a program called Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, our goal was to help companies um, take their businesses and their ideas to the global stage. Five years ago, we complemented that program with a program on entrepreneurial winning women, which is really focused on female founders. And then three years ago, we started our Accelerating Entrepreneurs program, which is really a commitment to emerging early stage businesses. And so you can imagine that over those 15 years, we have invested a lot of time and a lot of money. And helping that build that next generation of business, you can see how that clearly fits with our purpose of building a better working world. But about two years ago, um, I was on a plane with Tony, our CEO. We were going around doing our annual town hall road show. Uh, and the topic we were sharing with our staff was our purpose and trying to share examples of how we were bringing that to life. And what was interesting to me is during that travel for a couple of weeks, I kept picking up the newspaper on the plane, reading a few articles. And I found three entrepreneurs that we knew well and had worked with over those programs. Two had just signed game-changing contracts with large corporates, and one had signed a game-changing contract with one of our competitors. And it made me really stop and think about the conversations we were having with our staff. Um, clearly, for entrepreneurs, getting your brand out there and winning a trophy is a fantastic thing. But if we were really gonna help them build a better working world, wouldn't an organization with 7,000 people in this country and 270,000 people around the world do much better by giving them our business? It made me stop to question in this organization, had we really started to bring our purpose to life? Thanks, Lynn. Um, it's great to see that uh, we've filled rooms in the same fashion as children do. Back to the front, nobody in the front. Come on in, I know. So uh, you should look behind you to see who the naughty kids are. Look, I wanted to start off today, if we possibly can, uh, with, the, with a couple of quotes. You've already heard this morning, whether you're in this room or the one across uh, the corridor, about some pretty disruptive changes that are changing the way that we work and the way that the, the, the people around us think. Um, I like to start with a couple of these quotes when we're talking about purpose, and I'll explain, I'll explain why. The first is from the social commentator, Eric Quammen. Now, he set out a number of years ago that it was his belief within a decade uh, nearly 40% of the Fortune 500 wouldn't exist. Now, that's actually playing out to be reasonably consistent with what's occurred. And it's not just, of course, digital disruption disabling organizations. It's consolidation. It's organizations requiring to move within the value chain to, uh, to move where their customers and their suppliers are enabling them to operate best. Um, the second quote that I like to talk about, I, I like for two reasons. It's, it's firstly because we've never seen a more profound change in the way that we're interacting with our staff. Um, and that's probably most articulated by this concept of millennials. So the Gen Ys and the Gen Zs, um, this may come as a shock to you, you may already know this statistic, but in a little under two years time, half of the tax paying workforce in Australia will be millennials, uh, and so you'll have to deal with them. Um, <laughs> And they don't think the way that you do. That's actually even more profound for the next generation down. My children's generation, the I generation, we know from Harvard University studies that their, their brains are actually remapping in new ways because of the way that they interact with technology. And we actually never, will never be able to relearn that process. Um, things, are, things are very different indeed. So the second reason I like that second quote is because it's, it's mine. Yes, of course, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> but layer on top of that what we believe um, is an ever-increasing trust deficit between organizations and the communities and the customers um, and society as a whole. And if you think about what's happened in the U.S. with Facebook, um, obviously we saw Mark Zuckerberg front the Senate, um, and we saw their share price drop 18%. And while Q1 earnings were really positive, many would say they are not out of the woods yet. And then we can just come closer to home and think about what's happening every day in the papers with the Royal Banking Commission. And that trust deficit um, continues um, to split between organizations and the people that they serve. We truly believe that having an authentic, embedded purpose can help close that gap. 
We're going to share a short video now with some leaders sharing their perspectives on the importance of purpose. Anybody who uh, sets up a business uh, sets it up with a purpose. I think just, just being in business itself, uh, you're almost definitely creating something uh, to make a difference to other people's lives. Otherwise, you won't have a successful business. Um, and it's a, bit like, it's a bit like purpose, you know. There's a lot of people earnestly considering the question of purpose. Well, what the hell are people doing about it? And there is a notion that has crept into the press, into some people, etc., that if you are a purposeful business, that somehow it must go at the expense of profit. To do the right thing somehow must cost money. I, I don't, just don't buy into that concept. And I think the biggest challenge now for management is much more thinking about purpose maximization and profit maximization. And actually, when you do this, you will actually find out that your business will be more successful over time. Well, we first need to start with redefining what success is. If success continues to be defined as quarterly earnings, it's going to be very hard to achieve all the things we're hoping to achieve. Purpose is not an add-on to your strategy or to your business. It can't be. The purpose that we came up with is the most important business decision we made. So I know in recent years a lot has been said about purpose, but unfortunately that seems to be where it stops, at the communication level. Um, and communication is really important in terms of an articulate message that um, garnishes the power um, of your organization and your people, uh, but it's got to go way beyond that. And we believe that having a purpose that's clearly understood, articulated, embedded in everything you do, and actually used as a barometer for success is key to long-term sustainable growth. And you would have saw the statistic there um, in the survey we did with Harvard Business School that 87% of executives believe that purpose makes a difference and matters, yet only 46% of them said it was alive and well and informing their day-to-day -day decision making. And it's not just executives who care about purpose. Uh, you may or may not be shocked to hear that it's investors too. Um, we're going to put somebody up on the screen. Anybody know who this guy is? He's Larry. It's Larry Fink. He's the CEO and chairman of BlackRock, the world's largest investor. Um, this is his stock standard uh, LinkedIn photo, the photo that I had stolen away from me by our marketing team. Had a $350,000 watch in his arm to prove the point that he's the uh, richest investor in the world. Um, $6.3 trillion of assets under, uh, under management. And every year, Larry writes out a letter to the top 500 companies globally where he effectively sets out for them his expectations of what those organizations should be doing in the coming years. And for the last two years, his sole focus has been organizations requiring a need to refocus their efforts to look at long-term value, to stop focusing on short-term quarterly annual profits, and to think about how their businesses create value over time. Effectively, communicate the strategy of how those businesses are being much more purposeful. Now, he's not alone in that. Ernst & Young under undertakes research, and over the last five years, we've gone out to institutional investors globally uh, three times, and we've asked them a range of questions. And this last year, we asked them questions around uh, the specific questions that Larry set out for those, those companies themselves. And we were shocked to see that of the over 300 investors who responded to our survey, 92% agreed or strongly agreed that public, public company CEOs should be setting out an explicit strategy for how they create value over the long term and ensuring that their boards are across it. Now, if that doesn't surprise you, it should, because a, a lot of organizations aren't embedding within their own reporting processes and articulating a strategy of how their companies create that purposeful change over time. It isn't just executives and it isn't just investors. 
This also relates to, uh, to staff as well. And if we think about public companies who have got this wrong, uh, one of the best examples we can give, of course, is, is Volkswagen. What was a very small and cleverly devised cheat as part of their emission scandal process has now actually ended up costing them $25 billion US dollars. Now, what's interesting around that cost is that that is just the direct costs of recalls and fines they've had to pay, largely in California uh, and back in uh, Germany. And they haven't actually seen a, si a single civil suit hit them yet. Market commentators say that the total cost to them will be somewhere between 80 and $125 billion. Uh, and at, at $125 billion, it's fast approaching Volkswagen's market cap. So clearly, this issue of can take into consideration environmental factors, social factors, cultural factors is much more profound uh, than something that's an add-on to the business. It's embedded in how those organizations are creating value. And the issue for them with their customers, of course, is not so much whether they were cheating an emission scandal, it's can you trust them more broadly. Now, they're having to do an awful lot to re-engineer their purpose and make sure that what they're doing going forward uh, is much more around the long-term objectives that align with customer demands. In contrast, let's take another, seemingly another car company, Tesla. Um, they set out from the start what their purpose was. They want to accelerate towards a sustainable energy future. Now that doesn't necessarily sound like the mission of, or the purpose of, uh, of Tesla, but it is. And when they started out, they were derided by market commentators. They were short sold heavily in the marketplace um, and were, to be fair, a bit of a, a curiosity, if not a laughing stock. But today, maintaining that purposeful trajectory, they are the darlings of NGOs. Um, they have uh, they have a market capitalization larger than General Motors, and you know, they're loved by tech heads and environmentalists alike. And what's interesting is that appeals to their own staff. So an ex-Tesla employee said, uh, Tesla don't try and bring people in with, uh, with benefits and free stuff. Uh, they actually challenge you by saying, are you bold enough to come on our journey of changing the world? They buy into their purpose and they get their people, even though they're not paying their staff as much as their competitors. Elon Musk actually doesn't talk about his products very much. He talks about the context of his products in a future that he's trying to create. So we believe there are three things that will help bring purpose to life in an organization. Uh, and the first of those is alignment. Alignment of your purpose across your stakeholders, whether that be your employees, your customers, or your shareholders. Second is embedding it in everything that you do, uh, more than just a statement. Um, and third is being able to measure against that purpose and then communicate against those measurements. So I'm going to ask you to answer another question. If we can go to the Minty slide and we'll activate that. 100% um, aligned. How, did, how aligned do you believe your organization's purpose is with what your stakeholders care about? 100% aligned, somewhat aligned, misaligned, what purpose statement? If we've got anybody who's uh, still on that journey, that's fine. We believe this is so key, um, the alignment. Uh, and if you think about it, if you have your stakeholders aligned, they'll really buy in to your organization. And even those stakeholders you want to reach will buy into your organization. And I've always thought about it in terms of attracting, retaining capital whether that be human capital, whether it be investor capital, or whether it's customer dollar. Um, I think it makes a massive difference when you can get those things aligned, but I know how difficult it can be or be seen to be uh, in terms of how do shareholders truly buy into that. We believe that understanding uh, what's really important to them, I guess, is the first key to success. And your, in your example, alignment before achievement is absolutely right. So I wanted to start with one uh, of what I think are the most important stakeholders, and that's your internal stakeholders, your employees. I have always believed um, at EY that we can never be something in the external marketplace that we aren't for our people inside of uh, these four walls. Um, and I also know that our staff every year in the Global People Survey are really, I guess, yearning for uh, a connection between what their work is every day to something that has meaning. And we all know, we've seen all the research, that engaged employees provide a much better productivity outcome. Now, purpose isn't necessarily a new thing. Uh, some people have known about it forever. Uh, and I'm sure many of you remember the story. Um, 1961, 
uh, John F. Kennedy's first visit to NASA. Uh, we've heard the story of him meeting the janitor, and he asked the janitor what his, what his role was, and he said, my job is to help put a man on the moon. So purpose has been there uh, for people for a long time, but what's different is it truly is the new norm, and there is an expectation of almost every employee that walks in the door that their work has meaning and that they work for an organization that stands for something. I've got a short video now um, on some employers' perspectives on the value to employee engagement. putting humans at the core and an aspirational reason for being and that when organizations get this right it starts to drive their productivity and their profitability in a new way. But our employees too need to have a value of what it is that we're actually adding to the society that we're working in. Generally when I talk to uh, our employees they really, really enjoy the, the social side and the humanitarian side of what we do. So it's not, only about, it's not only about the bottom line, it's not only about the generation of financial wealth. So if you want to win in this, in this very, very tough industry and this tough world, you need to have the best people. And if you want to have the best people, you need to have a value proposition that is attracted to them. And a purpose that people can relate to is by far the best that you can have. We have shared values as a company. And so, um, and part of that is, I guess it's purpose-driven leadership. I mean, it's sort of like you have to have something, some self-awareness or something inside of you that says, um, I want to be a part of something that's doing good in the world. And I think that's a sort of a, a natural human emotion anyways. The company has been able to find that sweet spot of um, not only of doing well and doing good, it's actually something that pervades, pervades the company. The Triple P concept of people, planet, profit uh, it, it has always been a very important uh, driver. It is also the reason why many employees join our company, because we say we want to make the world a better place with the things we do. And especially young people, young scientists, are very eager to contribute to that, and that's why they join our company. Fear is just a negative um, that after a while just wears you down. You get up in the morning and you have negative thoughts. Purpose makes you think, I know why I am going to work. I know what my contribution to society is and I want to excel. It's a much more sustainable and powerful uh, driver than fear. If you believe in a cause, you know, you don't do something just to get a paycheck. <laughs> Um, just to get the work done, just to check the box. You actually believe in a higher calling. You believe that as an institution you're trying to achieve something that will really impact society. And I think that's where um, purpose can be inspiring. It can drive teams uh, to give that little bit extra to be truly innovative. I wanted to talk through an example from uh, an Australian company, from Qantas. So, I don't know if you know, but Qantas is one of the world's largest voluntary offsetter of greenhouse gas emissions through its, uh, through its tick box process that you'll all have seen as you book your flights to voluntarily offset your flights. Around 4.5% of all their customers check those box. And they started to look at that, and you, as you can imagine, through the frequent flyer program, Qantas have some pretty rich data on the individuals uh, who use their services and competitors' services, and they recognize something quite important. Those customers who offset their flights once increased their net promoter score uh, by 38%. If they checked it twice, they were a stickier customer. They were gonna, they were gonna hang around longer and choose to start, fly with Qantas. And if they checked it more than, more than twice, um, they were actually more likely to be a, uh, what they call a valued premium customer who go out and advocates on their behalf and effectively tries to get others to fly Qantas as opposed to their competitors. So they were a subsect that they were pretty interested in. They wanted to understand what that meant around uh, marketing of green products. So did, did customers really care about green products and, and the approach that they were taking to environmentally uh, sensitive activities? So they partnered 
with the Star Lab at Harvard University. It's a behavioral insights team uh, between ACT and Harvard. And they looked into the behaviors of 1,200 customers uh, that they have from their frequent flyer program, who they surveyed to try and find out just, just how uh, they make their decision processes and what it means for them going forward. So uh, again, take out your phones, don't check your emails. Take out your, your mentee process. We're going to go through. Now, I want to put you in the mindset of the customer, OK? So you are trying to give the responses of what you believe their 1,200 customers said. Now, the first question that they asked them was actually, whose responsibility uh, is it to be environmentally sensitive and responsible? So who, whose responsibility is the environment? Is it the responsibility primarily of governments, of businesses, or as you as an individual? It's very true to say that you are reflecting what the customers said about themselves. They very much thought that it was the, the responsibility of individuals to take, or take on managing their own environmental uh, uh, footprint. In fact, you are almost entirely on the money. Um, over 80% of their customers said that was the case. Uh, 80, 83 percent of customers said that that was their responsibility. Interestingly, for the people who tick the carbon offset box, 97 percent of them said that it was their responsibility. For government, you are overly enthusiastic. They were actually much less, uh, they were much less enthusiastic to, as to the responsibility of government. They actually didn't feel it was the responsibility of government. It was down uh, way below 50 percent of the respondents believed that government had the responsibility to look after the environment. Um, they think it's the, uh, the responsibility of individuals and businesses. So again, over 80% of people responded saying that it was the obligation of businesses to take care of the environment. And again, come back to their carbon offsetters, 91% of their carbon offsetters said it was the responsibility of business. So Qantas suddenly recognized that there was a real business case building here that they were deemed as being the ones responsible for air emissions and for other impacts on the environment, and they had this, uh, this vested interest from a consumer base. So they wanted to understand what that meant for their buying, buying patterns. Okay? So they asked them if they would prefer to buy from an environmentally conscious company, so one that demonstrates the right activities around looking after the environment and managing things for the longer term. 77% 77, 77 of their customers said that they believed um, they would actively go to, uh, to, to companies who were environmentally conscious. Um, now what's really interesting in relation to that though was whether they were uh, willing and looking for environmentally sensitive products from organizations like that. So we've got a bit of feedback. Um, and, uh, and quite a high number. So 63% of the people who said that they cared about these things um, actually told them that they would also pay a premium for products on the basis of their, their environmental credentials. And that's important because we tend to see research like this all the time where people say, yes, if you're doing good, we'll pay you more, or if we are seeing environmentally benefit outcomes, we'll pay a premium, and we tend to not see that flow through when the data comes out. Um, but actually, Qantas have the data, so they can actually see the people who are willing to pay a premium. And they know that of that 63%, the vast majority will follow the through in the relation to actions. So it was a bit of a call to action. Now, we do see a change, though, when the communication is better. It actually informs the, uh, the consumers as to what they're buying, why they're buying it. And so a lot of the efforts from Qantas has gone into their marketing activities. And the next question will hopefully go to that. So they wanted to better understand, of these people, of the 63% of the 77% that should be offsetting their flights who aren't, how do they better market to them? So they wanted to understand who they were. You know, 1,200 people, there's a pretty rich demographic there. So I want you to try and tell me what you think. Is it, what's the most predominant mix? Is it affluence? Is it the people who are more able to spend the money? Is it age? Um, pick your poison. Is it people who are retired with plenty of flexible cash uh, and their own homes? Or is it the young? Millennials, uh, or is it a male-female divide? What do you think? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So when, when the Harvard chaps thought about this, they actually guessed it was going to be a combination of gender and age. They thought it would be female and millennials is what they thought. What they actually found was there was no correlation whatsoever to any of the demographics. 
And so when they went back to their marketing arms and they started to chat to them about how they communicate better on their carbon offsetting programs, um, they came onto the first stumbling block, which is exactly to your point. The marketing team said, but we currently target people in this demographic, we target these people, we target these people, and you're telling me that this is a value set. So actually it's values that persist through a range of demographics, and it's actually going to require organizations to think around their marketing in a slightly new way. Um, so to your point, I absolutely understand there is complexity in seeing the, uh, the outcomes from these things, but it, it requires organizations to think about communications in a different way. And so we've talked a bit about employee engagement and customer engagement, a few stats to share. Uh, employees 1.4 times more engaged, 1.7 times more satisfied, and three times more likely to stay. Um, we all know the cost of turnover to our business in terms of dollars, but also in terms of intellectual capital that walks out the door every day. And then there's some uh, stats there around attraction and retention of customers. And the one that's really interesting is the second one for me, that there's been a 39% increase over the last 10 years of global consumers who would recommend a company with a purpose. Um, so some interesting statistics in terms of the, the importance um, of both engaging employees, uh, but also uh, engaging customers. So I think now is the time to acknowledge that we might have maybe a few skeptics in the room. Let's acknowledge the elephant. Um, and the question that you're saying is, Lynn and Matt, how is this any different than um, the CSR statements that came out of corporate uh, PR firms? Uh, how is this any different than the mission statements of the past? Um, so let's share a few of those and let's have a look at some of those fabulous mission statements. Um, but I will start by saying the reality is it isn't any different. It's only different if you embed purpose. So let's have a look at this first one, long one, but I'll take you to the last sentence, which I think gives it away. Ruthlessness, callousness, arrogance don't belong here. Any ideas whose mission statement that was? Think about 2001. Enron, fantastic. Uh, and what about this second one? It's our mission to continue to authoritatively provide access to diverse services to stay relevant in tomorrow's world. Any guesses on that one? I'll time you out because I created that on the mission statement generator bot, um, which takes a bunch of words and nouns to make fabulous corporate statements. So two examples of completely meaningless words. Let's fast forward and look at a few real purpose statements. Hopefully the buy online will give people a little bit of a guess there. Thoughts? Amazon, fantastic. Um, we save people money so they can live better. Let's think American, let's think large, let's think discount. Walmart, fantastic. Um, this one, we bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. The asterisk is for people like me so that I can buy their goods. <laughs> Nike, Nike. Fantastic. And then hopefully, if you listened at the beginning and saw the signs, you know this one. Um, so a statement is important, but again, it's only going to be different to what we went through 10 or 15 years ago um, if we truly embed it and bring it to life. So I want to go back to that story um, about uh, what happened after I came back um, from that flight as part of our town hall process. Um, I met with Tony, our CEO, um, and we set up what we call um, the Shared Values Leadership Forum at EY. This brought together our four service lines. It brought together the teams that look after procurement, the teams that look after sponsorship, the teams that look after talent, both attraction and retention. It brought together Matt's team uh, in climate change. It really brought together all of, the, all of the functions of the firm with a common goal of trying to understand how can we truly bring that purpose to life here in Australia, in New Zealand, for our people each and every day? Um, and I know firsthand how difficult um, that was, but I'm also pleased to say that one of those entrepreneurs that I read about in the paper just won a global contract to be a supplier of EY. So I'm really proud of the progress. And you can understand when you're a global firm with 270,000 people and you have economies of scale, how do you carve out something that matters in the local market? And that's the journey that we've been on. And we've made choices. What sectors do we want to play in? What clients do we want to work with? And what clients should we not be working with? Um, so really tough things. And I understand how difficult it can be to align a purpose within an organization. And we are still absolutely on that journey. But the upside has been really interesting to me as well. And I'll just share a few examples of things that have happened that we weren't expecting as we went on this journey. 
So we've been pretty um, active and vocal around reconciliation in this country and have a passion uh, for indigenous prosperity. And so as part of our reconciliation action plan, which I know a lot of corporates have been thinking about, um, we've made a commitment to indigenous procurement um, and made some good progress around that here locally. But what's been really interesting is the Defense Force has come to us uh, and sole sourced us to provide their indigenous pro procurement strategy. And they are one of the largest procurers of goods in this country. Um, so pretty exciting when something that you're doing for your own business can resonate in the external marketplace. And two other things I'll just touch on, which are related to a really um, not a great topic, um, but we all understand what's happening in the community around child abuse. Um, and it's something that we've been thinking a, a lot about. Um, and what it has excited me is we've been able to take some very traditional skills uh, and risk management frameworks that we've had for years in this business We've been able then to bring in data analytics and we've been able to bring in systems integration and can now work with state and federal government around prevention and prediction around where issues might arise instead of waiting till after something's happened. So it's really exciting. And I guess the challenge I'd put to all of you in your organization, what is the unique value that you have? And we're not doing this as a not-for-profit, let me be clear but how can you use those unique skills to solve a much bigger issue than maybe what you're solving today? And that's been really exciting for me. Thanks, Lynn. Clearly it's not enough though to have a set of corporate values or a mission statement to set out a way that you're gonna head forward. We do need to have meaningful tools to be able to measure and monitor success. Um, and let's be fair, in, 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 in the context of where we are, that's a, that's a long journey that we've still got to walk. So, Reporting today is largely historical, um, often without a great deal of data or anything more than estimates and forecasts as it relates to the future. And if we are going to be talking about creating a purposeful journey for organizations, we do need to be able to communicate to all the stakeholders we've talked about uh, this morning how you're measuring the outcomes from the programs that you have rather than the short-term profits from the activities that you carry out. Uh, we've been doing a bit of, think of it, thinking about that and we're developing a, uh, a long-term value framework in EY globally. Uh, but again, we can't do that alone. So we're going to be working with 30 organizations over the next 18 months to try and articulate how that framework might work for those organizations and in reality, uh, how that works in practice. So some of the companies we'll be working with, obviously, the likes of uh, BlackRock from an investor perspective, but um, organizations like Johnson & Johnson, Novartis, PepsiCo, Unilever and Nestle all going on this process of thinking through how does their purpose <coughs> relate to long-term results uh, that are meaningful to a broader range of stakeholders than they've ever had before. So hopefully if your organization hasn't started on the journey purpose, um, hopefully today you will take away that there truly is value in it for your employees, for your customers and also for, for your shareholders. Um, and for those of you that are on the journey, I would just challenge you to really think, um, are you more than a statement? Have you got to embedding it into not only strategic decision making, but the decisions that you make in your organization every day? Um, and I'll just leave you with one, I guess, final question. In today's world, can you afford to be an organization that doesn't have a purpose? So we invite you to stay, have a coffee, um, but thanks for joining us. <laughs>